Here's what's coming today on the Woodworking Network podcast. Isn't it weird that sometimes you actually fire somebody and it's the best thing you could have done for that person? Welcome to this episode of the Woodworking Network podcast. Join us as we explore the business of woodworking, big and small, and what it takes to succeed. I'm Will Sampson. Today's episode is sponsored by WoodPro Expo California and the Executive Briefing Conference. We'll be talking with Jim Bouchard, founder of the Sensei Leadership Movement. But first, I want to talk about, are you a manager or a leader? Management and leadership are two terms bandied about business circles on a regular basis and often used interchangeably, but they really are two different things. Here's the way I look at it. Management is the tactical process of getting people to get things done, while leadership is more strategic and points to the direction you want things to go without specifying the details of how you should get there. Management is like following a recipe line by line to put a specific meal together. Leadership is more like asking, how can we have a really nice dinner to serve on Saturday? Another big misconception about both terms is they are always top-down processes. No matter what your position in your organization, from entry-level employee to the owner of the business, you can practice both management and leadership daily. And if you aren't, it is likely hurting your business and your contribution to it. Salespeople often talk about managing expectations. That's a part of management that can be practiced by anyone at any level. If you are being told to do something, make sure you understand what that entails and that you manage the expectations for achieving the stated goals. Maybe the people asking something of you have no clear concept of what's involved, and the challenges inherent in reaching the goal. Or maybe you can clearly see a better way that will easily surpass the goal. All of that needs to be conveyed up and down the chain as part of the management process. On the leadership side, my friend Jim Bouchard, founder of the Sensei Leadership Movement, likes to talk about inspire, empower, guide as three important components of leadership. All of these reflect that the role of a leader is much broader than just managing. It's much more about having vision to see beyond what those focused on details are seeing. It's about striking sparks to ignite fires to propel action in a positive direction without just burning down the whole business. Of course, the sweet spot is when you get a happy marriage of management and leadership throughout your team, so everyone is excited to be moving forward and knows intimately what the direction forward is. But even if you achieve that level of success, don't expect it to last. The only constant is change, and likely some crisis will rear up to challenge you no matter how well running your operation is. That's why it's so important to constantly foster both management and leadership. Often it takes one to grow the other, especially when something happens to block the road ahead. Strong management under the direction of strong leadership will always find a way to deal with the roadblock. Before we get to our chat with Jim Bouchard, let's pause for a word from our sponsor. It's really easy for woodworkers to stay stuck inside, focused on their shops and production. But over the last couple of years, the pandemic has forced them to be even more isolated than usual. Now it's time to get out of the shop and resume life in the outside world, especially when there are great opportunities to network with your woodworking business peers. Coming up fast, April 27th to 29th in sunny San Diego, WoodPro Expo joins the Closets Conference and Expo to offer an unparalleled opportunity to boost your business with intelligence on techniques, tools, and technology. Then in September, in Colorado Springs, there's the Executive Briefing Conference. Let's get face-to-face -face again. Learn more at woodproexpocalifornia.com and executivebriefingconference.com. See you there. 
Now let's talk some more about leadership with Jim Bouchard. Today, my guest is Jim Bouchard, founder of the Sensei Leader Movement and author of The Sensei Leader, a popular speaker on leadership issues. He'll be a keynote speaker and facilitating a leadership workshop at the Closets Conference in Woodpro Expo, California in April. Welcome back to the Woodworking Network podcast, Jim. Thanks, Will. It's an honor. It really is a treat to always work with you guys. Thank you. Well, I, I always enjoy hearing what you have to say. It's uh, frequently insightful. We have a, a lot to talk about today. I think the last time we had you on the podcast was uh, during the early stages of COVID-19 pandemic. Oh my And God. we talked about leading in a crisis. What are right. some of the leadership lessons we've learned from the pandemic? You know, the best leaders uh, that I've seen navigate this, this uh, crisis is are the people who stick to the basics, you know, and really connect strongly with, with the people they serve. Um, you know, I'd, I'd love to share some magic formula with you, but there isn't one. It's hard work. It's really, it's, it's tough to connect to people's hearts, but the people who did that and the people who show genuine caring and compassion, um, you know, I, I hate that people still relate that to so-called soft skills, right? They're the most essential skills you can have. The better you can connect with the people you serve, then the better they're going to perform, especially when, when stuff gets difficult, right? Um, and as, as you've probably seen across all the industries we work with, uh, you know, no big secret, right? People who, leaders who mistreated their people or folks that acted uh, dictatorially or, or, you know, fell into that authoritarian slip. Well, what happened? People left them, Right. And they left them in droves, and and we're seeing a lot of that, right? That that huge migration away from different organizations. So, yeah, if you connect with people, uh, you've got a much better chance of, of keeping good people around you. Yeah, leadership is definitely a two way street, and I think that uh, with the difficulty in finding good employees these days, uh, more employers are learning that the you know my way or the highway is not necessarily the only way to operate. Oh, in, in fact, it's a very dangerous way to operate, isn't it? I mean, now they're calling it the Great Resignation. You know that people are just flocking away from from bad leadership, and that's one of the number one reasons they cite. You know, um, and I know it's difficult because in in a crisis mode, you know, urgency can really take take a grip on you, right? And that's when we see people fall into that authoritarian slip. But it's understandable. Sometimes it's even rational. But you got to be very careful. You got to you know always look in the mirror and see you know see how your your actions are being perceived by the people you serve and the people around you because. Uh, if you're not sensitive to that, before you know it, people are gone, people resign. And too often I speak to leaders who, who are just questioning what the hell happened. You know, they, they're looking around and say, where'd everybody go? They didn't even realize they fell into it. That's why I call it an authoritarian slip, right? It's, it, it's a slow process and any of us can fall into it. Um, that constant, constant process of in, introspection, which again is hard and it takes time. And that's why it's extremely difficult in, in a tough situation. But it's one of the most necessary practices we can we can have as a leader. Now, in the last few weeks, the pandemic has been uh, completely overshadowed by the the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Mm. We've seen some amazing examples of leadership. Uh, none the least was a, a fellow who went from being a stand up comedian and a television personality mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. president of Ukraine, uh, Vladimir Zelensky. What makes him stand out as a leader? Well, again, I mean, <laughs> as much as I'd like to come up with that that secret sauce, just look at the way he connects with people. I mean, that's it. And there was a recent article about that, in fact, that said probably his the key to his success and his ability to rally people is uh, listen to his speeches. Is he appealing to the head or is he appealing to the heart? You know, and that that's a very important but difficult uh, distinction. Um, you know, we often make a distinction between a manager and a leader. Well, a manager will try to motivate where the leader inspires. And inspiration is really, like I said, talk, talking to people's hearts, to their emotion. Motivation, in fact, the root of the word motivation means to provide a reason for action, right? And the only problem with that is we're not reasonable creatures. You know, science is, is bomb-proof on that. We're emotional creatures. And we support usually our emotional decisions with reason. So the more you can appeal to, to people's emotions, then the stronger you'll connect as a leader. And that's obviously what Zelensky has been doing. And 
the other, I think the other major factor, and it's a huge lesson for us all that we can forget from time to time is that man walks the walk. I mean, he's been putting himself in very dangerous positions. And, I, you know, people like to say fearlessly. I doubt it. I mean, seeing him, I'm sure he has moments of, of, of grave fear. But courage is not the absence of fear. The absence of fear is stupidity, right? So he's a man who sees what needs doing and he does it, even though it's difficult, it's not expedient, and it's extremely dangerous. And and those, I think those two factors, which any of us can do, I mean, hopefully we don't have to be in that extreme a situation in order to express courage, right, in order to express compassion. Um, in fact, when we're not in an extreme situation, that's when it's easiest to forget about these things and, and not practice them. Um, but there you go. And, and great leaders step up in great times. And uh, he's definitely walking the walk. One of the things that, that I always think is interesting and, and is sort of my theory on, on his success as a leader is that he, is, he lacks the professional experience. He isn't a professional politician. He doesn't know what he's supposed to do. And so he looks in his heart and and in his experience and says, well, what should I do in this? Right. What's the right thing to do? And he's doing that. Authenticity, uh, right? He, he's being who he is. And too, I think too many times leaders, especially emerging leaders, are looking for that grand moment. They're looking for that grand gesture. And that isn't what you need. It's what you just said. It's looking into yourself, right? And and knowing who you are and doing what you can do within the scope of your talents and abilities in the moment. Of course, you can always expand on those talents and abilities and skills and experiences. But um, at, at any given moment, we've got to work with what we have, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that, that kind of gets to one of the next things I wanted to talk about. It, it seems to me that the one of the things I find most powerful about leadership in a crisis is how people rise to the occasion. Mm. Uh, Larry Adams, uh, our online editor at Woodworking Network, came up with a great story interviewing Oksana Donska of the Association of Furniture Manufacturers. Right. In yeah. Ukraine. Thanks for sharing that, by the way. Yeah. Um, she told a truly <laughs> heartfelt story about the effects of the war and how woodworkers and furniture manufacturers in Ukraine have changed direction to support the defense mm -hmm. of their country. Mm -hmm. um, what kinds of things, lessons of leadership do you do you see from that? One of the big things there it reinforces a theme that, you know, we talked about in Colorado last year, and I'm sure we're going to dive into deeper this year, is that leadership really has nothing to do with rank, title, or a position of authority. One of the things that impressed me about that article that you shared, and again, thanks, thanks again for sharing that, um, was that people from all different levels of her organization and all different levels of the industry were stepping up and doing what needed to be done, right? They saw needs and they were able to pivot radically in, in their case, right? Uh, she talked about furniture manufacturers pivoting to, to make bulletproof vests and, and provide supplies for, for the troops and provide humanitarian supplies. I mean, that's, you know, you can look at that and say, wow, that's quite a radical departure. But obviously there were leaders there at all levels. And I'm sure right on the front lines who said, hey, look, this machine can also do, right? Our skills can also be applied fill in the blank. And that, you know, that's, that's an amazing theme. Leadership shouldn't be restricted to the elite. I, I, it still sickens me that, that some people still think that. Now contrast that to somebody like Vladimir Putin, who's obviously, you know, he, he exemplifies our definition of a dictator. How is he getting the, his job done? If you want to look at it from that perspective, through fear, force, and coercion. Uh, there was a recent article that he's fired over a thousand members of his staff in the last few years, right? And replace them. Why? Because they didn't agree with him because, uh, you know, they weren't marching the march. They weren't telling him what he wanted to hear. And he controls other people through that, you know, do as I say, do as I, as, as I want you to do, or you're gone. Um, in some cases killed in that case, but again, to take it out of that extreme, it, 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 the extremes are useful because they give us a vivid picture of what can happen. Right. But think about that in our own lives. And, and I'm as guilty of it as anybody else. Any of us can fall into that mode where we're, we're trying to get the job done and, and it's too easy to fall into fear, force and coercion, you know. And again, that's why we're back to that motivation versus inspiration. Motivation is simple. Scare people or bribe them, right? And you bribe them with incentives, you bribe them with quotas, whatever. 
scare them with threatening their jobs, threatening their livelihoods. Uh, th- those are the things that, you know, the tools that a, that a bad manager will use, where a leader is going to appeal to the heart and say, look, how can we work together towards something that's bigger than all of us? And again, that article really pointed that out, didn't it? Um, those folks are rallying around a cause that's far bigger than, than any of the individuals involved in that cause. It's, it's beautiful, really. Well, I, I think something you touched on, too, is, is important for our, our audience. You know, uh, not everybody is the guy in charge, right. but mm-hmm. the guy at the <clears throat> lowest levels can practice leadership too. Um, you know, that they talk about managing up, you know, and, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. managing your manager, things mm-hmm. like that. You know, the way that, that anybody communicates with anybody they work with, no matter what they are, their level is in the hierarchy of the organization, they can exercise leadership. No, absolutely. You know, it goes back. I always quote Admiral Grace Hopper with this, where she said, management is about things and leadership is about people. Now, don't get me wrong. Management's important. You've got to take care of, of the business side of things. You've got to take care of the mechanicals, right? However, you know, where does leadership come from and who expresses it? Everybody at every level is capable of it. And again, it, it, I, I'm repeating myself, but it sickens me that this gets thrown into the soft skills bucket. Um, these three key words that, that are always appearing on our website and our materials, inspire, empower, guide, Right. These are not soft things. Over years, we found these are the most essential practices that a leader can embrace to be successful, to you know, rally people to a cause. And they're difficult. Like I said, they require a lot of practice. And we can get technical about how to, how to implement these things. But the fact is that you, know, you, have to, you have to be willing. Again, we said appeal to the heart. That's the inspire part, right? Uh, empower, give the people what they need to get the job done. And I mean, emotionally and spiritually, as well as as materially, and then guide them. I mean, be the person there to sometimes take a hand, sometimes be a strong critic, um, constructive critic, hopefully, and sometimes even uh, guide people out the door. You know, and it's funny because I'm challenged sometimes people say, Jim, you're just talking about compassion for an hour. Now you're talking about firing people. I said, well, yeah, if you have a a poor performer, um, you know, how compassionate are you to the people around them if you allow that to to fester, right? But you know, like I said, when we talk about those three words, inspire, empower, guide, who, who's capable of doing that? Well, anybody, right? Yeah, Some absolutely. of your greatest leaders are on the front lines, aren't they? And they don't have a lot of power or authority. And face it, there's lots of people with power and authority in excess that are pretty poor leaders. Um, but right on the front lines, how can we inspire the people next to us? And one of the greatest ways is by our own example. Isn't it so simple, right? Enthusiasm. Again, soft skill, right? Baloney. How many times have you been in the room with someone who's enthusiastic and man, your your heart's pumping and you're ready to go as opposed to coming to work and we've all been through this, right? You come to the work and there's Eeyore. Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, another day. Yeah, how's your day? Well, oh, sucks so far, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> right? And how important is that? That's you know, that, that can't be discounted. It can't be pushed into that, into that, uh, onto that back burner. You know? Oh, yeah. Well, and, and you talk about, you know, sometimes the good leadership is getting rid of a few, few people. And you have yeah. to think about the, the good of the team. And, and, right. you know, if you have those Eeyores or whatever <laughs> who are, are holding you back, right. Um, you know, maybe they need to look for another opportunity. Um, you know, somebody challenged me just a couple of weeks ago on, I was doing a, a, a presentation with some, some college students in an entrepreneurial program. It was really interesting. And, you know, one of them said that she, she said, what do you do with someone who just isn't willing to do these things? You know, they're just not willing to come on. And I said, kill them. <laughs> of course, I, I said, well, you know, you, you had a martial arts guy there. So what do you expect me to say? But I said, no, seriously, you have, you have to, you know, you have to cut them sometimes because, you know, my, my question to this person is how much work are you going to put into somebody who's not willing to grow and develop and change, right? Which is, you know, the essence of life and the essence of leadership. And if we're not willing to, that's, that's the most important thing. Aren't, aren't the best leaders the ones not only who embrace change, but who make it happen, right? Inside as well as outside in their organizations and in their communities. So um, I said, you're not being fair to the people who are, who are putting the effort in, Right. You're not being compassionate to them if you're constantly dumping your your uh, time on someone who's who's not willing. 
And frankly, and I'm sure you've been through this too, isn't it weird that sometimes you actually fire somebody and it's the best thing you could have done for that person? They were right. too weak to move on to something that fits them better. And their next adventure may be the right one for them and they might thrive in it, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I heard another story that was very interesting um, coming out of the, the Ukraine. It was an interview with a, a young adult uh, Ukrainian talking about what she and her friends are doing to help refugees. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing that she contrasted the efforts of the young people just diving in to help with yeah. what she described as the initial reaction to wait for the government to do something that her parents mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. older people who grew up in the communist and socialist structures of that area before yeah. they'd been indoctrinated to do that. It was, you know, the government will take care of it and we're not going to do anything. Mm. But she said the young people who grew up in a more open society actually feel more personal responsibility to do something themselves yeah. rather than defer to authorities. And they, they just didn't, you know, it wasn't even a, a, a thought. It was just, oh, this is what we need to do. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting because one of my inspirations is my grandfather, who's my mom's stepdad, was my mom's stepdad. And he actually rode out on horseback against the German tanks you know, back in the day. Wow. And, you know, I think sometimes it skips a generation. Of course, he was captured right away and spent the rest of the war in a concentration <laughs> yeah. camp, but he was a very, very brave man. And you think about that, skips a generation. You're right, that next generation was kind of indoctrinated into the into that authoritarian mold. And then maybe this generation listened to their grandparents' stories a little more. I, I, I don't know. But um, again, you're talking about where does leadership come from at all levels? A leader, somebody who sees what needs doing and does it. I, I was so inspired by that uh, uh, Miss Ukraine from the Miss, from the Miss Universe pageant who picked up a rifle and went for it. And you're seeing these stories everywhere. There was a picture of a of a woman. I think she was in her seventies with a with a Kalashnikov rifle standing there, keeping the the Russian troops off her property. Is is that amazing or what? I mean. Yeah, it's, it's hard Where for us, you know, thousands of miles away, uh, you know, to even uh, have any kind of experience of of what they're thinking and what they're doing and and what's going on there. Um, no, but you know what's cool, uh, you know, from working with your groups uh, last year in particular, you know, Colorado, I got to meet quite a few, you know, people in the woodworking network, and they they gave me a lot of hope. I mean, they really did. You know, I steal much more from the folks I work with than. Than they steal from me, I'm sure. And that's not a cliche uh, way to say that. Um, the, you know, the compassion that your organization showed, the people in your organization showed, the caring they showed for their, you know, for the folks that they serve was remarkable. And so that's, you know, the, you're the type of people who form that, that core, right, that we can, we can depend on when things get tough. Sadly, you know, a poll was just done last week that said, and it's for the first time in history that this turned this way here, that less than half the people in the United States would take up arms if we were invaded, you know, and I'm sure I'm sure your group would be on the opposite side of that by and large. I mean, they were very vibrant people and caring people and I think would do anything they needed to do to take care of others, you know, and and that's that's what we need more of. It was it was disheartening to me to hear that poll. I mean, I couldn't believe it. Well, we had we had all sorts of stories that we have run in the last few weeks of various uh, woodworking uh, supplier companies and all, uh, you know, spearheading donations to, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, non-political charity organizations and things like that to, right. to try and help the efforts there. And, and I, and this happened too in the pandemic where we had, you know, woodworking companies that uh, shifted to making, you uh, uh, personal protection gear and, mm -hmm. and helping local hospitals and things like that. So, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I think that that is a part of our DNA for most folks, if mm -hmm. we can recognize it, but sometimes we can't. And, you know, you, you sort of joke about the, the soft skills thing. I just did a, an interview, uh, with uh, Patrick Mulzahn, who uh, is the author of uh, uh, the seminal textbook for woodworking in uh, uh, schools. Uh, and uh, uh, he just uh, did this like sixth edition of this modern cabinet making book, and it's a thousand page textbook. But mm -hmm. one of the things that they added to it 
was a bunch of little short case histories to help emphasize the importance of those soft skills of how um, folks that you know started out most of the people in the case histories in that book are from Patrick's program mm -hmm. um, and he's taught you know hundreds of students over the years and uh, and they're now you know successful professionals and yeah. they talk about some of the skills that have little or nothing to do with woodworking that mm -hmm. are absolutely vital for their success it's funny because that imprint, whenever I was training someone to become a sensei, you know, and, and run their own school, I said, in this job, you will use everything you've ever learned anywhere, you know, and they looked at me and I, and I, of course, I married that with asking them what the definition of sensei was. And they'd usually say teacher or master. I said, no, no, janitor. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know you, but you seriously, you'll use every skill and, and most jobs, you can say that, especially in leadership positions, you're going to use every skill. There, there are no unrelated skills or experiences, right? It's what you draw on and, and make it part of who you are as a leader. But you said something interesting too. And one of the big questions, and I think, I hope is something we'll get into deeply at, at the uh, closets conference is, um, you know, how do you develop this next generation of leaders and how do you build the resiliency? How do you build the courage? How do you build the confidence in these folks? And again, it's a simple but not easy answer and it requires a lot of discipline. You've got to give them the opportunities. You've, you know, we're only tempered under fire. And as you said about the folks that are emerging in Ukraine, now, again, hopefully it's not that extreme a situation, but can you give your young and emerging leaders, your aspiring leaders, can you give them opportunities to lead some of these pivots? Can you solicit their ideas and see what fresh, you know, fresh ideas come in from their perspective? And then when they come up with an idea, can you, again, empower them and guide them, give them the tools they need to run forward with that? And sometimes that goes outside the organization. Like you said, uh, supplying uh, PPEs and things like that to the community, you know, community outreach. Um, that's a very safe way to develop leaders. It's not a big financial risk to the company itself, right? If that person doesn't perform 100% well, they're still doing something good and they're not hurting you. So there's lots of ways to do that. But even internally, you've got to give people really authentic uh, experiences and there has to be a little danger and a little risk. Of course, as now we're talking about management, if you got to manage that risk because you don't want somebody destroying the company, you don't want to throw somebody out without any tools, right? Or well, any, you don't want them yeah. to fail anyway, too. You, you don't mean, want you them wanna, to fail. You want to test but, them, but you don't want yeah. them to fail. You don't want them to fail, but there always has to be some possibility of failure, at least to right. some degree, right, to temper right. them. Otherwise, you know, that's the, the re, we've seen the results of that, the trophy for every kid generation, right? Absolutely. Um, yeah. We've experienced that, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, th I think that uh, uh, clearly there are leadership lessons with and without crises every day that we mm -hmm. uh, live. There should be lessons that we can take from just the people if, that we if encounter. If we're willing, right? If we're yeah. willing to look, it's not yeah, always easy, is it? If you're willing to look. And I think that's, <laughs> yeah. you yeah. know, that's, that's part of it is just mm -hmm. learning to have that leadership vision uh, yeah. that you see, you know, this is not the way something should be done or boy, that, that would, there would be a better way to do this, you know, just mm -hmm. to be constantly looking for, for uh, ways to improve things and yeah. ways to develop your people, um, right. ways to develop your colleagues. You know, our main, um, our main voluntary focus at the sensei leader movement is working with incarcerated kids and, it's interesting because I was just working with a group the other day where we got into talking about wisdom and how wisdom shouldn't be a, a rare commodity. We all possess wisdom. But of course, they were struggling with the definition. And believe me, I, I've done workshops with CEOs of huge companies that struggle with this definition, right? And the martial arts definition that I learned, I think, is the most practical, most useful to us. It's certainly knowledge and it's certainly experience. But most people stop there. Wisdom is knowledge and experience. I'd say it's knowledge and experience tempered by awareness. And that's looking in the mirror, right? And that's not always easy to do, again, especially when, when you're in crisis mode. Um, but I don't know, I probably ask, I usually ask this question, so I probably asked it with your group last time, is you know, what's the best mirror for any leader? And of course, it's, it's the people that we serve, if we're willing to accept that feedback. You know, and again, I, I know we're talking in extremes a little bit today, but look at somebody like Putin. 
or any number of, of so-called leaders in, you know, throughout history like that. If you surround yourself only with sycophants, then you're not getting that, that constructive feedback. You're not getting a true reflection, right? You're not getting that, that authentic awareness that, that needs to happen in order for you to learn to grow and develop as, as constantly as a leader. So, you know, that's, that's the important part and it shouldn't be rare and it should be shared, um, you know, without any expectation of return, you know, unconditionally love, respect, and wisdom. If you share those three things unconditionally, you're going to, you're going to do okay. But that's again, simple, not easy, right? Simple, not easy. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's uh, life in general. Well, right. on that note, that's a, I think a great place for us to, to stop today. And I'm looking forward to uh, uh, talking with you more in April in San Diego. And uh, I'm sure our folks that, uh, 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 come to the, uh, the shows there, uh, are going to get a, a really valuable experience. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I think this is, is crucial stuff. I mean, it's, it's high level things thinking about leadership and, and all, and, and some people may be focused on more practical things. How many cabinet boxes can I build today or whatever, but right. Which is important. Yeah. You, yeah. but you, you, you have to think about some of this yeah. high level stuff and, and we're realizing mm -hmm. today across the globe that uh, uh, a lot of uh, key things happen because of uh, leadership, both good and bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I encourage people, Hey, come ready to do battle. Let's uh, let's have a conversation. I hate, we'll tell you, I hate lectures. I don't like to come out and lecture. Let's have a good conversation and, and, Come prepared to share your wisdom and your experiences because, uh, hey, any of us, we have a, each of us have a small slice of the pie, right? It's by putting it all together that we, we can share better ideas, huh? That's it. Well, thanks a lot, Jim. This has been great. We'll see you oh, in well, San Diego. You. Always a privilege. Thank you. That's it for today. If you're looking for more of our podcasts, you can find all of them at woodworkingnetwork.com slash podcasts and in popular podcast channels. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Thanks again to today's sponsor, Wood Pro Expo and the Executive Briefing Conference. If you have a comment or topic you'd like us to explore, contact me at will.sampson at woodworkingnetwork.com. Thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>